Hi, HR Nation. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives from the world's leading global brands. On to today's show, we're joined by Ritu Kieran Jackson, Director of HR Operations, EME at GoDaddy, and founder and CEO at Orbidities, which raises awareness, builds acceptance, and promotes diversity with a focus on autism. Welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you, Chris. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Before we jump in, tell everyone um, a little bit more about yourself personally and your your journey to where we are now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm born and raised in the UK. I went through my regular studies, went to uh, King's College London and University of Oxford. After that, I joined the consulting world, working for Accenture. um, And then moved straight to the dark side. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I'm no, I'm no, joking. no, I'm, I'm joking, joking too. Accenture have been great. They've been a, a foundation <laughs> of um, skills and assets that I still use today. And um, after that, I went in house and moved to a variety of different uh, other industries and clients and uh, employers that I've been working for. Um, and finally, ended up at GoDaddy and then ended up uh, founding wearing company Abilities, uh, which stands for Autism Plus Abilities. Um, but actually, that's just been a little bit about my kind of journey in my career, but actually what's really influenced me starting up Abilities is um, in 2019, um, my my son, um, Kyan, was diagnosed with autism. Um, And I also had a near-death experience. And that near-death experience, really, I said to myself, if I wake up from this and if I if I survive this, I'm gonna do something different in my my life. I'm going to utilize my corporate skills um, but do something for the autistic community because that means so much to me. Wow. Um, and I did, I did survive and I'm here, which is great. Um, and that's why I'm working towards now changing my life and doing something for the greater good. Amazing. It's funny how in our darkest times that we, that we come out and create such incredible things like you pursuing this passion, right? It's in those moments where we reflect um, on things. For me, it was with my anxiety and depression of like, I just can't do this anymore. Like I have yeah. to either make a change in my life or, 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 I, or I don't want to think about the worst case scenario, but you know, you're in a, when you're in a bad place, it kind of makes you kind of look at everything. And that's where people make the most drastic change. It's absolutely um, right. It puts things in perspective and it really helps you to focus on what is it that you want to deliver in the world? What do you want to be known for? Right. Who are you? Yeah. So tell everyone a bit more about abilities. What's the goal? Yeah. Um, you know, t- tell everyone a bit more. Great. So our um, vision really is to help organizations out there in increasing their their value from their people by using neurodiversity. So what that means is if we break it down is people are every organization's greatest asset, right? And we've seen so many studies in the past um, that tell us that the more diverse a workforce you have, the more valuable uh, your products or your ideas or innovation or communication, et cetera, et cetera, could be within the organization and outside, which which actually affect the bottom line. So whilst we know all that, what we're seeing is there's actually not a huge amount of neurodiversity within that diversity space in organizations, right? Um, Mostly because it's a hidden disability. So when you think of not just autism, but when you think of dyslexia, when you think of Tourette's, you think of ADHD, they're all hidden disabilities. And so the idea is that, hey, we find a way in which we can identify support and increase the value of an organization by using neurodiversity to mm-hmm. help them do that. And, you know, of course, I've got to focus on the, on the autistic community. So we also find meaningful employment for autistic people within the organizations. Yeah, fantastic. And because this is something which only in, in the last couple of years I've seen come to the forefront, neurodiversity. Yeah. Only for my per- myself personally, I only came in, only, only educated myself about what it was like three years ago. Before yeah. that, I'd never heard of uh, neurodiversity before. Exactly. Uh, it is, um, it is a, a recently coined term, but actually they've all existed for many, many years and yeah. decades, right? Mm-hmm. We've just never, never really paid that much focus or attention to them. Um, so like, let's take autism uh, as one example. Actually, if we look at studies for the past 20 years, we've seen that autism is on the rise. Um, if we take some, some statistics uh, as an example, so uh, globally, the statistic is one in every 270 people around the globe have autism. Now, actually, that statistic is thought to be underrepresenting because not everyone can be diagnosed, especially in low income countries where they may not have the right skill set or the right diagnosis tools, et cetera, et cetera. So if we look at some high income countries, like let's take the UK, 
how many people, Chris, do you think in the UK are, you know, out, out of 100, how many do you think are diagnosed with autism in the UK? Uh, like 10. So not as high. It's one in 100, which equates to about 700,000 in the UK. Now, that's the UK alone. Let's look at Australia. It's one in 70. Let's look at the US. It's one in 54. Right. So when you start looking at these high income countries, these are countries that, you know, can uh, they have the right diagnostic tools. They have mm. improved reporting around it. They have all the means to, to do the diagnosis. You can see that there's an increase in autism and the diagnosis of autism over the last 20 years. Yeah. So when you speak to organizations, uh, is this something that you find that most companies is on their on their radar or, or not, not, not at all as a priority? So this is interesting because. It depends which organizations you speak to. Um, Microsoft, SAP, EY, and JP Morgan Chase got together and they created the Autism at Work program. And they did this about seven, eight, nine years ago. And they're still running it now. And what they did was they recognized, hey, there's a huge pool of autistic talent that we can utilize that can benefit our organizations. And we're not tapping into this talent pool. So they got together, they created this program. They actually created also a playbook so they give this playbook out to any other organization interested in creating a similar program because they recognize that, hey, there is um, benefits here we can, we can tap into both from micro to macro levels. So when you speak to the kind of forward thinking organizations or organizations who are starting to look at this, you can see some progress. But this is definitely not widespread. This is definitely not, you know, something that exists across all countries, all organizations. And, and that's what I'm well, abilities is here to do, right? To help raise that and try and make, make sure we, we integrate that in, into other organizations as well. Yeah. So what are some of the things you're doing to raise awareness? Yeah, really, really good um, question. So our main motto, our, our mission, should I say, is to raise awareness, to build acceptance and promote diversity. And what that means is we want to raise awareness of autism through training, ultimately. Now, this can be classroom training, it can be virtual training, but actually what we specialize in is digital content. Because as I'm sure you know, Chris, yeah, class, it's my world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can, you know, play them back again and again, revisit them as many times as you like. They're accessible from anywhere in the world, blah, blah, blah. So there's just so many benefits of, of having some digital content available. So we have a, a library of engaging bite-sized videos around raising what autism is, uh, about supporting autism. So if you have a colleague or a workmate who has autism, how do you interact with them? We have videos around, if you're a manager, how do you manage someone who's autistic, who's in your team, right? So we have lots of videos around that. That's just to raise the, the awareness, but training really is just the intervention. It's not the strategy, right? It's one intervention that can help the strategy. So our building acceptance piece is around how do you create inclusivity in organizations and build that acceptance as culture? Right. Yeah. And the way to do that uh, for us is we, we do a consulting piece. So we have a, a diagnostic tool. We go in, we do perform this diagnostic tool, takes us three days. And after which we've got a, a great result of, OK, company A, you're doing really good in these areas. There are some areas of improvements in these other places here. Now let's work on how we uh, improve those areas of improvements. Right. So what do we do? What strategies do we put in place and how do we foster that culture of inclusivity, especially for the neurodiverse where it could be hidden? Right. Mm -hmm. Are there many companies out? Um, go on, sorry, go for it. I was just saying, finally, the last part is promoting diversity. So the way we do that is by resourcing. So we help uh, organizations identify the roles that could be suitable for the neurodiverse, i.e. people with, with autism. And then we help source people and fulfill those roles. And we also help the process, the recruitment process, as well as if um, a person with autism was successful in obtaining the role, then we help them with settling in and understanding their expectations of the job and so forth. Yeah. The, 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 uh, we kind of asked this question a little bit earlier, but do most yeah. companies take this into consideration in their hiring process? Or is it literally one size fits all? So this is uh, really interesting because uh, when you asked, uh, you know, about organizations and where they are with this, yeah. they said, you know, there's some really forward thinking like the Microsoft SAPs, et cetera. There are a lot of organizations who want to be, they just don't know how to go about it, right? Because they might not be subject matter experts, for example, right? Um, and also they need to be seen to be doing the right thing. So um, it's interesting. What, what we're finding is that you have what I'm going to call a standard recruitment process, which is someone applies for a job, you go through a series of interviews, and at the end of those series of interviews, that you either got the job or you haven't, right? That's a standard process. But actually, what are those interviews measuring? So they're measuring social ability and social aptitude, which actually for someone on the spectrum might not be their greatest point. They actually might find that very, very challenging. This is why I was asking. Yeah, so that's, that's yeah. what I was thinking about. 
Yeah. yeah. So what we're doing is we're encouraging organizations to find an alternative method. It doesn't have to change the entire method. You can still have the standard process, but to find an alternative. So when you have people with neurodiversities where the standard process doesn't fit, they have an alternative method to go down. And usually that alternative method for people with autism uh, looks as work assessments. So what that means is you invite them for, say, half a day or a day's work where you can still assess them, but you're assessing them in terms of their skill set for the job and not their social aptitude. Yeah, because that's the part. Yeah, that, that, I'm so happy you said that now, because that when you talk about that, that's exactly what I was thinking, because that's gonna, not going to work at all. We're seeing them do the actual job and assessing yeah. them that way is yeah. the best way, right, to, to do but it. But it's also, you know, I speak to organisations, as uh, one was just recently in last week, and, you know, they have situational questionnaires and personality questionnaires as part of their process. And again, for someone on the spectrum, you're not going to get the answers uh, that, that you're probably expecting from someone who's neurotypical, because one of the beauty, one of the greatest assets that someone on the spectrum can provide is that they think differently. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you have them sit in a situational questionnaire and actually how they approach that situation is completely different, you know, the organization who's doing the assessment might think, okay, well, this doesn't meet what we're looking for in terms of answers, but actually they're missing the point. That's a good that's thing. That's the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. talk about that. Diversity of thought, right? Neurodiversity, that's one of the biggest, like one of the, a big benefit that can bring that can bring to organization. Let's talk a bit more about that. Yeah, there's, there's a huge amount. So the spectrum is very, very wide. And um, I want to make clear the spectrum is not linear. It's not you're on this end or that end of the spectrum. It's, it's not a linear spectrum, right? You can have different facets of the spectrum. Um, so just to give you an example, you know, some people with autism, you know, they process information differently. Some people find change very, very difficult. They prefer routine. Some people mm -hmm. can struggle with social norms and cues. But that doesn't mean that someone on the spectrum has all of those things. It can yeah. completely change. And when you add that to their personal circumstance, like, say, personality, which is driven by nature and nurture, it, re it really means that there's a saying, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. I saw that on the website. That made me yes. think, it made me stop and think for a bit when I read that. <laughs> yes. So you can't apply a blanket approach. So if you, if you met one person, you cannot say, oh, I met this person with autism. That's what autism looks like. And, and now I understand it. And that's what's applied to every other person who is autistic. Actually, no, they're, they're very, very much individual, A, because of the spectrum, B, because of their own personal attributes that they bring as just being a person, right? Yeah. Um, so when we think about, to go back to your question about, um, you know, neurodiversity and, and, and thoughts, um, actually what we find is that the neurodiverse, because they do process information or think differently, there can be a huge amount of benefits, right? There could be better communication within teams because you've got someone who's bringing a different perspective to that, to whatever solution they're trying to solve or whatever problem they're trying to solve. You can have... Um, more innovation when you come up with different ideas because you have a different way of approaching things, right? Um, you can also, it, organizations can, can um, benefit from having a more attractive employee value proposition because they've now got a more diverse workforce. So actually, if you've got autistic people in your workforce, you're likely to attract more autistic people who want to join your workforce, right? Mm, yep. So there's all these kind of things and the, the benefits range from, from micro to macro as well, right? So I've just given a, a few there. A, a, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the benefits provided by someone who is autistic is pretty, uh, so they're, they're pretty individual. They're pretty, like I said, you've only, if you met one person with autism, you met one person with autism. So you're not going to get the same thing by hiring another person with autism. So it really is about fitting the role and the person and understanding the benefits that that person can bring to that role in that organization. Yeah. So it's a little bit different to, let's say, if you were going to go through a traditional recruitment consulting, a traditional recruitment consulting firm will go to an organization and say, hey, what roles have you got? And then they'd go out there in the world and source candidates for those roles. It's kind of different, right? Is there a company that specializes in, in, in placing people, people with autism in organizations and providing that support? Yeah, so we do that. So you do so, that too? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't so know that. Do. Yeah, so we're working with um, an organization at the moment where we're really working on their recruitment process and helping them to source and place autistic oh, yeah Fantastic. so we do that but that, that's my point the the way we do it is not going by going to organizations like a typical model a traditional recruitment model and saying hey what are your roles let's go then find the candidates we actually find the candidates first and then we go to organizations saying hey we've got these these great candidates we noticed you've got these roles we think they'd be good at it what's your process and, and then you're working with them to actually uh, on not just putting that person in but preparing them Making sure they're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's because exactly it. That's the hard yeah. part, right? Because otherwise is, they're just going to go into an environment where they leave just as fast as they come in. Uh, absolutely. So, you know, first of all, it's very difficult for 
people on the spectrum to go and you know apply to a job right first of all that's very daunting scary for anyone <laughs> yes yes yeah, so even you more imagine, so yeah exactly. exactly imagine someone on the autistic spectrum where they are four times more likely than someone who's neurotypical to suffer from anxiety and twice more likely to suffer from depression so you put them in situations where their anxiety levels can rise they don't know what's coming they don't know the process because how many how many companies do you know out there who advertise a job and say by the way, this is the process. Once you apply, then this will happen, then this will happen. They don't because often the companies are a little bit more flexible. So it's not usually defined up front, right? So even just that alone can, can give anxiety for someone who's on the spectrum because they don't know what's coming, right? Yeah. Um, but then even if they do apply and let's say they were successful in getting the role, um, once they're in the organization, unless the organization has some support mechanisms in place to help that person, the likelihood is they may end up leaving because if you haven't educated your workforce, if your employees, your teammates, your managers don't know how to support you, then how are you going to feel part of that organization and part of its culture, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, if you had to, if you had to guess, Chris, um, so look, at, look back at some of those high income countries, let's take the UK. If you had to guess how many people on the spectrum who are not in full-time paid employment, what would your guess be? Well, as, in I'll a, give you, as, a, as a percentage? As a percentage, I'll give you a clue, it's, it's high. Oh, not in employment. Not in employment. Uh, what, so what, they're on benefits, for example. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, now you said like 40%? 84%. What? 84%. 84%. Of yep. Of people on the spectrum in the UK are not in full-time paid employment. And guess what? That's despite over 70% of them wanting to be. Wow. Right. And, and that, I that's thought, I thought my number was high. Yeah. Wow. Now I can see why you're doing what you're doing and you're so passionate about it. That is a shocking, that, 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 um, that really, that's so, we were speaking before the show about how my, my mum fosters kids with autism. And so that really worries me now because I kind of see, see them in my, and, and many of them are super capable, like <laughs> of being, oh, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. You just threw no. me off. Without, I'm shocked at that number. Yeah. Yeah. 84% of the UK are not in full-time paid employment. That's Over so, 60% yeah. want to be. And actually that story or, or that picture is not unique for the UK, right? In in the US, that, that statistic is 85%. In Canada, is 86%. So the, the point of it is you've got a huge population here who want to work and they're not in work. So they are drawing down from the government in, t in terms of welfare, right? Because they're not finding those right opportunities. They find those barriers for them to enter the workforce. Right. Yeah. So the reason why abilities exists is to break down those barriers by raising the awareness, by building the acceptance and then promoting diversity by putting them in positions where they have work. Right. Yeah. What are some of the other things we can do then to like build acceptance and remove that stigma? Is it is it is it because companies think that they're not capable of doing these jobs? Like I know it sounds pretty harsh, but like what what's the main reasons companies aren't looking at this talent pool and, and seeing this untapped resource? So I think the first thing was actually just awareness, right? Like you mentioned it yourself. You said, oh, I didn't know about neurodiversity until two, three years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So one thing is just around awareness. And there's been lots of movement and lots of campaigns recently to, to bring up the awareness, drive the awareness, which is, is great. But there is now a campaign going on saying awareness is not enough. Hashtag awareness is not enough. I love that because it's all, it's what, what, well, clearly the number, that you just is all one thing that the awareness is there, but then another thing actually, is it making a difference, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so now organizations are in a position where I think they're starting to realize, hey, there are some real benefits if I can hire from this talent pool that, that we can realize as a company, right? And actually, I mentioned earlier, just before I answer your question, I mentioned earlier about the micro to macro benefits. So we spoke about what it could do for the organization. We talked about communication and we talked about innovation and things like that. What it does for the individual is unbelievable. So what drives us, uh, Chris, just general people, what drives us? It's having a job. It's having a purpose in life, right? Purpose, now yeah. imagine that. Imagine that opportunity is taken away from you, and so you don't know what to do with yourself. So you've got a lot of people in the autistic talent pool where that opportunity isn't presented to them for one reason or another. Different types of barriers, which we can go into in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but really, by giving someone a job, it gives them purpose and meaning in life. So you often find that a, a job given to someone from the autistic talent pool is far more meaningful to them than your average or, or regular neurotypical, right? So um, that's one, one benefit on an individual level. The benefit on the organizational level we've already touched on. Yeah. There's also other benefits, right? What we find is 
organizations have a huge influence in society in general, right? Some of these big corporates, your Googles, your Facebooks, what they do matters. You know, if they want to plant trees or save an ocean or change climate, you know, work towards climate change, et cetera, et cetera, what they do and what they invest their time and resource in, it matters because it influences society. So if we can get some of these big organizations also to look at the autistic town pool and really start hiring, which we're seeing with your Microsoft, your SAP, et cetera, then actually you're, you're already, already influencing society to say, hey, these people are capable, their abilities are just different, that's all, right? Yeah. Because obviously there's still a huge stigma attached just in general society too. So that's one of the macro kind of benefits. When you um, mentioned um, the, the, the why and the personal element to it, how does that make you feel as a parent? So it's a good question. Um, it's my driving factor, right? So when my son got diagnosed with autism, mm. uh, the first thing, and I guarantee this is the first thing, that every parent of a child who has special needs education, the first thing they think is, right, how do I make him independent and self-sufficient? So when there's a time where I'm not here, they're going to be okay. So that's the first thing that came in my head. To do that, I started looking up, okay, what kind of jobs do people with autism have? Where do they go in life? And that's when I came across those statistics that I mentioned to you. And that's when I thought, this is horrendous. Yeah, you know, it is horrendous. It's, in the UK. Yeah. Mm. it's horrendous. And, and no way do I want my son, Kyan, growing up where when he hits working age, those statistics haven't changed right? There's got to be more acceptance built so that actually his generation and the generations following him, they can also enter the workforce just as easily as neurotypicals. Mm -hmm. On that yeah. point, you mentioned jobs. What are the jobs that typically those organizations like the Microsoft, the Accenture's, oh, oh, sorry, the other, others that you mentioned, what, yeah. what are the typical jobs that they hire Yeah, for? it's a good question. So um, typically someone on the spectrum will look for jobs that are um, related to say processing. So if you're looking at um, patterns or numbers or, or kind of data roles, or if you're looking at even testing, so any big IT project that has like testing and things to do that, with that, you know, those kind of roles and engineering. So those kind of roles are typically what is associated with someone who's autistic. And whilst that's true, that there, there is that, that those types of roles in those industries that can exist, we're actually starting to see other industries open up. So for other people on the spectrum. So let's take retail, for example. Um, when you go to your local supermarket, Chris, you probably see some folks wearing those um, sunflower lanyards, which, which sing signals that they've got a hidden disability. Um, so now we can see retail are starting to open up with also hiring people from the spectrum as well as other hidden disabilities. So uh, what I'm trying to get at is because the spectrum is so vast, you can have people that are very, very, very good at processing data and information and numbers, which will then go towards a more IT engineering side. But then you can have people who are very good with daily and repetitive tasks that will go more towards, like, say, your retail customer service side. Yeah. So there's a completely different, um, completely different way in which you can tap into people and where they can go. But honestly, I was talking to one of my one of our clients, um, and uh, you know, they have a really good suggestion. They have high churn for a particular role in their organization, and it's not IT and it's not retail. And they said, hey, we have a high churn here. If we make this role really black and white and really easy to do, do you think someone on the spectrum will be interested in doing it? And I said, I can't see why not. And not only would they be interested in doing it, actually the retention rates for people on the spectrum are around 90%. So you hire someone- They really want to, as you said earlier, they want, they love it, they love doing absolutely. it. Absolutely, absolutely. You hire someone, they'll do the job. They like doing repetitive tasks. They won't routinely get bored after like two or that's three what years. They do. Yeah, that's what they love. Yeah. And then they'll they'll be loyal as well, right? And obviously, I, I'm speaking generally now. You'll obviously still have people that don't quite fit this um, this model, but you know, I'm just mentioning some of the some of the key things we have seen. So, I think at the moment there's been a big drive towards IT engineering and some in retail, but it doesn't mean there are other industries and other departments in which autistic people cannot go into. I think there are, and we just need to open our minds a little bit and really define the role a lot more. Yeah, I'm glad you answered that because that is something I struggle to maybe people listening of what are the roles, yeah. right? So I'm sure you get that question a lot from people like, great, yeah, but yeah. what are the particular I roles as well? Because we have a um, an organization in our office complex that, that we're in now. There's like, you know, 50 offices in, in, in this building. Yeah. And there is um, a, an organization, a nonprofit that has kids with special needs that come in and we basically bring them in different companies all around the building to help um as part of the development so tasks and stuff like that which is really cool um to, to, yeah, to be able really to do and that i've seen it like firsthand them do all different jobs 
they're building this as part of helping their development uh, yes. as well so yeah like yeah. it's uh it's pretty and amazing it gives, them, it gives them insight right to what you it's can like see how happy work. they are doing it though yeah. they're so happy they're, they're so excited like unfortunately with what i do i don't have uh, i wish i did have something I've, i could bring them in and help me with because i don't i just don't really have I, but I see other organizations offices that I do and they love it they're so excited yeah. whenever I see them and I say hello and interact they're like really excited to go and do those things yeah um, yeah well. absolutely. So, absolutely how do you people probably wondering how do you manage this whilst being a full-time you know HR director of Europe Middle East and Africa at a, um, at a great company like GoDaddy they're very supportive so, um, right they're very supportive that's what I'm getting at yeah they, they, they are super supportive um you know like I said earlier when we spoke um, you know, for the podcast, they um, they advocate people within their organisation to go and do other things that are either their passion or they want to make a difference or whatever it is, because actually they encourage people walk, walking the entrepreneurial path. That's who their customers are, entrepreneurs. So they do advocate that. And they've been super, super supportive. They can understand, they can see um, the difference that I'd like to make in the world. And they can see obviously how my skill set also lends to that, that, uh, that difference of what I'm trying to achieve. So they've been super, super supportive. Um, it, it has been difficult, I'm not going to lie, to juggle everything. Uh, I have been working crazy hours. Um, but of course, for me, this is not work, right? This, this exactly, part it's what you love, right? Yeah. People don't really understand that, right? Because they're like, friends of family of mine, they're like, oh, Chris, you work Saturdays, you work down like, but it's not work. So they can't relate. It's like, oh, it's not because I want to do that. You know, you, you'll be at home late at night watching Netflix. I'm doing this because this is what I believe in. It's what I'm passionate about. It's yes. what I want to do, right? So, yes. yeah, we, there's, we need to find another word than work <laughs> for it because that isn't the right description, is it? <laughs> and you know what? I have a daily reminder. That's my son. So I have a daily reminder of what's That's true. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy, by the way, that we're speaking um, as well. And um, congrats, obviously, on everything you've done so far. I know you're still early on the journey. Um, yes. as well, it's incredible. I, and again, I said earlier, and I'll say it again, even on the show, I think you should have your own podcast. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. it'd be really cool to have people on the show and share their journey. Um, I think a fantastic thing you could do is work with those organizations that are hiring and interview some of the people about their roles yeah. in the yeah. organizations and share that as a journey and a story. One, for organizations to see how these people are thriving and two, for people with autism to see it too. I, I totally agree with you. Um, I everything incredible. I, I, I totally agree. I think it's a fantastic idea. I've noted it down. So watch maybe um, sometime soon. Or like a day in the life like series, maybe. <laughs> like a day in the yeah. life where you get them, follow them in their job for the day. And like, just, yeah. you know what I mean? Just as... Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, because we can talk about it, but hearing it from them directly would be amazing. And then and, seeing and on, it. Yeah. Yeah. And on that point, so everything we do is through the voice of the autistic community. So for example, I, I mentioned to you that we do digital content. So um, script writers we use are autistic. The You're practicing what you preach. Yeah. Exactly. If we mm -hmm. can get uh, autistic narrators, which we have done, we'll get them to narrate the, the scripts. It, everything we do has Amazing. their voice in it, um, as well as academics and as well as obviously some uh, corporate advisory members as well. Yeah. I'm excited to see your Belize podcast. <laughs> it's going to be really cool. Oh, before, I, listen, before, I, before I let you go, where can people, like, if they want, you know, we'll learn more, connect with you, reach out, where's the best place? Yeah, perfect. So our, our website is abilities.com. Uh, our general email address is info at abilities.com. Simple as that. But of course, feel free to um, also connect with me on LinkedIn. Amazing. Well, look, thanks a lot and um, keep up the amazing work and I look forward to chatting again soon. Thanks, Chris. Bye.